Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Uh, I'll invite you to stand one more time out of reverence and respect for God's Word. If you are able to stand, we will read verses 1 through 22. This is the English Standard Version. There are pew Bibles in front of you. Make use of those as you need. You can even have one of those if you don't have a Bible. Um, Follow along as we read the first 22 verses of Acts chapter 4. At the end of reading it, I will say... This is God's word. If you agree that this is God's word, will you say together, thanks be to God. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. For it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the, in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, Common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, They let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is God's word. Together, you may be seated. So my wife uh, just left the building, I think, so that means I can talk about her. Um, no, probably not a good idea. I don't know who said that. David said, Brian said, not a good idea. Um, no, but uh, I will tell you a little secret about my wife, uh, and it's a sign of our culture as well. Um, our culture has a fascination with false confessions, false Confessions, And what I mean by that is when you listen to all the true crime podcasts like she does, you hear many stories about people who said they did something that they didn't do. And you think, how in the world did somebody say they did a crime that they did not do? Why on earth would anybody do that? So she will put her earbuds in and clean the whole house and listen to a tr- true crime podcast, and the whole house will be clean by the time it's over. Um, she loves this stuff. 
But what happens is there's a tactic employed by certain police officers or detectives or investigators, whatever, in which they manipulate people by wearing them down until they say the things they want to hear, right? Um, And so eventually, after hours and hours and hours and hours in the hot seat of being interrogated, being yelled at, being, you know, told what to say, they finally will corroborate with whatever they're supposed to say just so they can leave the room. I mean, they'll keep people for days sometimes, as long as they can. Uh, Mariana has told me, if I ever get arrested, you don't say nothing. Keep your mouth shut. So we have a, we have a pact that if, that if we ever get arrested for something we didn't do, we ain't, we ain't budging, we ain't talking. Don't say nothing. Um, so some of you may have been arrested. Some of you may have been interrogated, uh, but I doubt anybody among us has been put in the hot seat like Peter and John here in this passage. Here was a clear religious scare tactic, uh, religious manipulation by the council of the Sanhedrin, the rulers and the elders and the high priests come together to tell them to comply or else. But the story of Peter and John, of course, didn't make any podcasts didn't make national news because there were no false confessions that day. The apostles faithfully held the line and proclaimed Christ no matter the consequences. This is a significant turning point in the book of Acts and also in the early church because as the church was growing rapidly after Pentecost, many were coming to faith every day. They were meeting in one another's homes with sincere and and glad hearts in the temple. They were teaching and preaching and praising God. Uh, They had everything in common. They were sacrificially giving to one another. And it's not clear how much time has passed from Pentecost to this point, but it's clear that it didn't take long for the flags to start being raised among the Jewish people. And the power structures of the day were now getting involved. They could delay no longer, and they choose to get involved just at the right moment when thousands more are coming to Christ after a very public miracle was performed right there on temple grounds. The lame man leaped, ran around the room, went into the temple for the first time. The voice of the church was growing louder and louder and louder, and the Sanhedrin would now do whatever it took to lower the volume. Today in our text, the apostles are arrested, interrogated, and threatened. That's the outline of today's sermon. Arrested, interrogated, and threatened. And we know, of course, you read the book of Acts, this is only the beginning of the persecution that was going to take place. Uh, And it's only the beginning of the biblical truths that we will learn when it comes to how we are to respond biblically to persecution when it comes our way. Today, we learn that our response to the silencers is to be a humble and committed testimony to the truth of Jesus Christ. Our response to the silencers is to be a humble and committed testimony to the truth of Jesus Christ. So let's see in the first four verses how Peter and John are arrested. They were speaking to the people and the priests of the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. So uh, just to remind you what took place in chapter 3, Peter and John were on their way to the temple to pray at the ninth hour, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They came upon a man who was born lame, unable to walk, Never walked a day in his life, was daily carried to the temple to receive alms. Peter and the man make eye contact, and Peter says, Silver and gold I do not have, or have not I, or uh, have none, uh, or whatever the old way the, the preachers used to say it. Silver and gold, I ain't got it, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The man was healed, he leaped up, 
fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 35. He ran inside the temple for the first time in his life. This caused a great scene, a great crowd. All the people saw this lame man who they knew every day as they went to the temple. They seen him. They knew who he was. They saw him leaping around. They, they went to Peter and John to see what was going on. Peter then takes the opportunity to proclaim Christ to everyone in the temple, reiterating all the words of all the prophets from Moses to Samuel and all the rest. God raised Jesus from the dead to bless you by turning you away from your wickedness and to bless all the families of the earth through you, through the proclamation of Jesus' name. Imagine young boy Jesus teaching in the temple and how they marveled at his teaching. Remember grown-up Jesus preaching the kingdom of God in the temple, teaching as one who had authority. Now see Peter at the temple preaching the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and thousands of people coming to faith in Christ as the lame man leapt for joy. This was the culmination of all Jesus' teaching ministry to the Jews. And we'll see in a few verses here that Christ himself came to be the new temple, the very cornerstone that the builders rejected. Well, who are the builders? I should say, who were the builders? The priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees. All these came upon Peter and John as they were speaking to the people and it says, because they were greatly annoyed. And the priests, of course, just to tell you who these people are, uh, they were the ones that, of course, interceded for the sins of the people. They represented holiness. They were the connection point between God and man. The captain of the temple was kind of like the second in command. He's the guy with the big key ring on the side of his belt. Uh, he ran the operations. And then there were the Sadducees who had lots of run-ins with Jesus, as we know. And the Sadducees were basically the, the sorriest Jews out there. They had political ties to the Roman government, and they were just really bad at being Jewish. They denied a lot of the Old Testament. Um, they believed mostly the first five books and uh, kind of hit or miss with the other teachings. Um, most importantly, they denied uh, any resurrection of the dead in any capacity. And so here's Peter saying, God rose Jesus from the dead, he rose this guy uh, from his lame legs, and now he's going to raise everybody from their sin who believes on him. They didn't like that, right? Imagine the scene. These weren't security guards that came up to Peter and John. These were the top dogs themselves, the executives. The priests came to the scene. And they were greatly annoyed, which means they were really, really stressed out. They were bothered. Their hearts were beating rapidly. They knew that Jesus rose from the dead. Everyone knew that Jesus rose from the dead. But for a time, it had been quiet. And now all of a sudden, things were sparking up again and getting out of control. They have to control the narrative. They have to control the flow of this story before it slips away from them. They have to stop this. They have to diffuse the situation. They have to silence all the crowds. Arrest these men. You can almost hear the audible gasp in the room as thousands of people saw the lame man leaping and now being arrested with Peter and John. And they were taken off to custody. Peter was preaching, Jesus is alive. All the prophets had foretold it. This was supposed to take place. And then silence as they were rushed off. But the word did not return void. Many that day, the text says, who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. Even after getting arrested, the power of the proclamation of the gospel prevailed. Thousands were saved. And Luke has been recording, right, the numbers for us, starting at 120 in the upper room. They're praying. When Pentecost came, then 3,000 were added to their number. Now he says 5,000 men, which is literally males. Uh, the same predicament we have when Jesus feeds the 
all those people, the bread and the fish, right? Just men. So there could have easily been upwards of 10,000 people there who were converted and added to the church at this point. And what was it that saved them? That they saw a miracle? No. It wasn't that they thought their bodies could be healed like the lame man's. It was the hearing of the word that brought faith to their dead hearts. The Lord turned them from their wickedness through the proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the earliest days of the church, there have always been those who have sought to silence the proclamation of the gospel. In our day, of course, we love to point to social media regulations, intolerance or tolerance, whatever, inclusion, you know, things that are important and certainly need to be considered, but aren't that bad. We live in a democracy that proudly boasts of the freedom of religion. People worship in all kinds of ways. Nobody tells us what to do. But I think the biggest silencers of the gospel on the west side of the globe are the people in the pews. I have preached close to 300 Sunday sermons at Main Street Baptist Church. The majority of them have been live-streamed, published, broadcasted across the World Wide Web. Not one of them has ever got me in trouble. But I have gotten in trouble a number of times by people in the pews. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell who the true enemies of the cross are. But the clearest enemies are those who seek to stop our mouths and keep the ministry of the word from progressing. Those are the enemies of the cross. There's a pastor in another sister church of ours who's doing revitalization, having a really hard time. Uh, I believe he's a wonderful pastor. He loves the Bible. He preaches the Bible. And they've just been awful to him. <laughs> they've just been really mean. Uh, terrible things. Secret meetings, spreading rumors, trying to start conflict. And all of this is to serve as a distraction from the ministry of the word, which has the power to save sinners from sin and hell and damnation. My advice that I uh, give him every time I see him is, brother, you've got to outlive the bullies. You've got to outlive the bullies. Just keep preaching. Because ultimately, the bullies will lose, right? It's the word that always wins in the end. Isn't that a wonderful truth from this story? Is they're literally taking off to be arrested, but then 5,000 people are saved? Or at least the number got up to 5,000 men? The word will not be silenced, no matter who the bullies are and how loud they try. We have every reason to be confident, even under the greatest scrutiny, even under being interrogated as we see is what happens to them next. Verses 5 through 12 record the elders and the scribes, the rulers gathered together in Jerusalem with the high priest Annas, a former high priest, Caiaphas, the current high priest, James and Alexander, all who were of the high priestly family got together the next morning. They were kept in custody overnight. It was already later in the day. This was also just a convenient way to sort of diffuse the situation and keep everything hush-hush. And the next morning, they were going to meet together anyway, as they usually did. The Sanhedrin would gather with all the big people. This was at least 71 people made up the council of the Sanhedrin, plus probably more because all of the high priestly family were there. It seems like they gathered some extra uh, numbers to be more intimidating before Peter and John. And this was not a good cop, bad cop thing, right? This was, if you don't tell us what we want to hear we will ruin you. You should be really afraid right now. So in verse 7, they ask their question, by what power or by what name did you do this? There's a right answer in their book to this question. And it's not totally clear if they're trying to give them an out and opportunities to sort of recant the name of Jesus and move along, or if they're trying to peg them on a crime. They could charge them for blasphemy like they did Jesus. Israel was not a nation that believed in religious liberty. You didn't worship Yahweh, you could be crucified, right? But instead of falling for either trick that they might have been pulling, 
Peter says, I'm glad that you asked. I, I would love to tell you by what name this has happened. That's kind of what Jesus told me to do when he left, is to tell as many people as possible by what name these things have taken place. So filled with the Holy Spirit, it says, Peter testified, let it be known to all of you, to all of Israel, that Jesus is alive and he did this. You want to know how the crippled man walks? By what means he was healed? By the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you well. And again, this is why it's likely they, they arrested this guy too, right? He was standing before them well. The lame man taken out of the temple. Nope, they don't need to see him running around. And Peter and John. Peter says, look at him. Look, You look at him. He walks. Surely this was part of Peter's confidence when he stood before them that the man was there and, and was well. But even more than that, Peter's confidence came from knowing that Jesus was alive. God raised Jesus from the dead. What are they going to do to him? God raises people from the dead. At the arrest of Jesus, right, when Jesus was still on the earth and before the whole crucifixion, Jesus or Peter acted like a coward. He didn't know all the things that were going to take place. But now, post-resurrection and ascension, there's no fear. No fear. He stands before the highest people on the planet in the eyes of the Jews. And Peter is telling them the very thing that could have him killed. Not only the resurrection was his confidence, but also the presence of the Spirit. It says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He received the Spirit at Pentecost. And now here Luke makes it clear that this is the Holy Spirit helping him to testify to the truth of Jesus in this moment. Peter remembered what Jesus said to him back in Matthew 10, what we read this morning. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Through the help of the Spirit and the knowledge and the testimony of Jesus Christ, this made for some powerful preaching, right? The Holy Spirit, the knowledge and the testimony of Jesus Christ makes some good preaching, amen? Right? That's how it works. Uh, but, but this is where his boldness came from. And then the Spirit gives him a little bit more ammo than that. Verse 11, Peter reminds them that the Jesus he's been talking about is the one that they killed. And he, and he, he says this, this stone was rejected by you, the builders. Y'all killed him, and now that stone has become the cornerstone for the church. This is a reference to Isaiah 28 and Psalm 118, this cornerstone reference, the stone the builders rejected. Um, and it also refers to an actual building process, right? Typically, there was a primary stone, a uniquely cut block that would serve to uh, be a, a foundation for the rest of the building work that was going to take place. Jesus came offering himself to be their foundation. He says, I'm that stone. And the builders say, no thanks. We have a stone. We're the stone, right? We don't need you. So they killed the author of life, as he said in the previous chapter. But now by his resurrection, Jesus has become the cornerstone of a new and better temple. You remember the story in John chapter 2 when Jesus whips out all the money changers at Passover, right? He then proceeds to tell them, tear down this temple and I'll build it back in three days. And they marveled and said, what are you talking about? You can't do that. You know how many years it took to build this thing? And of course, Jesus was talking about his own body, which is why Peter would then go on to write, 1 Peter chapter 2, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by man, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is now the foundation, the builder, and the door to a new and better temple. 
which uh, is compiled of the believers. Those who came to faith in Jesus were being built up like little stones with Christ as the cornerstone. The presence of God is no longer kept in a physical four walls, but in the people of the church, the bride of Christ, whom he is head over and has given all his blessing to. He is our cornerstone. Now, Peter is telling them like it is. He's not only telling them like it is, he's saying, y'all boys are out of a job, right? Y'all were the builders. You thought you didn't need Jesus. He doesn't need you now. This was an incredibly offensive thing to say. You are now leaders of a false religion. What you are building is meaningless and empty. You are unemployed. Christ himself is the builder of a new and better temple. And then in verse 12, the greatest offense of all, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. How does Jesus build the new temple? He builds it by saving. And there's salvation in no other name but his. The rulers, the elders, the scribes, the Sadducees, the captain, the priest, Annas, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, none of these names have the power to save sinners. No man can save other men. There is but one name given among heaven that can save, and it's God's Son who became a man, came at the right time, that he might be the once and final sacrifice for all sins. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There is something about that name. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there is something about that name. Friend, I assure you, full of the same Holy Spirit that Peter had, that there is only one way to God. And it may be difficult for some of you to come to terms with. We see all the religions of the world, men and women who are generally good and kind and loving people. How can we say that they are going to hell unless they repent and believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins? The reality is, we don't deserve any way. One way is plenty, when the alternative is zero ways. We should marvel that God has provided a way at all, and that one way is his son, Jesus Christ. We don't need multiple ways. We have the way. So I urge you, if you've not come through the one way, life and truth, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be made right with God, your sin stands against you. God's wrath stands against you. You will not survive the judgment. You will perish forever in eternity in a place called hell. Come and believe on Christ today. The one way that was given for sinners to be saved forever. There's one name. Believe on him now. Repent of your sins and turn to Jesus be made alive once and for all. And beloved, if you are in Christ today, take heart. You have the one name. You have Christ. There's no other name that can save you, and you have it. Do not be anxious. Do not be troubled. Do not be fearful. Jesus is alive, and he has given you the Holy Spirit to help in the most dire of circumstances, Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, and he will, and he has. You have Jesus. Hallelujah. All we have is Christ. And that's good news because the circumstances are only going to get worse. The text ends, verses 13 through 22, of being not just questioned, but now threatened by the Sanhedrin. How did the council respond to Peter's testimony? Well, it says in verse 13, they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They were common, uneducated men. They were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. The word for boldness here is the same word used in chapter 2 by Luke when Peter's preaching at Pentecost, and he says, I may say to you 
with confidence, boldness. It has the implication of certainty, assuredness, surety, right? No doubt in his mind. He knows what he's talking about. No gimmicks, no magic tricks. This is just truth, just plain truth. They believed every word they were saying with full conviction and confidence. They were absolutely certain in the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this is amazing because it's based on the boldness here of Peter and John, their certainty in the gospel of Jesus, that the rulers recognized that they had been with Jesus. They were common, uneducated men. They didn't realize that these were the very disciples that walked with Jesus for three years. But when they saw their boldness, they realized this was the man whom Jesus cried out from the cross to take care of his mother because he was about to die. This was the same man who crept about in the shadows near the light of the fire talking to the slave girl on the night when Jesus was arrested and beaten, tried. These were these men. These were the disciples of Jesus. They were uneducated, common men, but they'd been to the master's seminary. They'd been with Jesus. They knew him. They had confidence in him. They weren't as dumb as they looked. They taught and proclaimed with certainty, confidence, wisdom, boldness, even in front of the entire council of the Sanhedrin. It's one thing to preach this way in front of all your Christian buddies, right? With boldness and power and certainty. It's another thing entirely to speak this way in front of the highest level of authority. I came across a story while preparing for this that I thought was pretty good. Uh, there was a Methodist preacher uh, many decades ago, who I'd never heard of, uh, named um, Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright. And he was informed one Sunday morning uh, at his large church that the president was going to be in attendance. His deacons came to him and said, we know that you are used to saying whatever you want in the pulpit, but President Andrew Jackson is going to be here today. You may just want to be on guard a little bit. So, here's how he started his sermon with President Andrew Jackson in the pews. I understand President Andrew Jackson is here. I have been requested to be guarded in my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he does not repent. That'll preach. As you can imagine, the congregation was astonished that he would say this. <laughs> for the president. But the president actually talked to him after the service and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. The president was impressed with his boldness to say these things. His certainty would not soon be forgotten. This is what happened in front of the Sanhedrin. Verse 14 says they had nothing to say in opposition, right? The lame man was standing right there. They couldn't respond to their bold proclamation of Christ or to the fact that the lame man was walking around. So instead, the council had to take a minute. Can we get five minutes real quick? We need to kind of talk about this. And they didn't know what to do, right? What should we do? The sign is evident. It, it's obvious. There's no contest. The man walks around. They did this in the name of Jesus. We can't tell them they're wrong, but we can tell them to stop. So here's the new plan. In order to stop the spread of this teaching among the people, you know, that, that kind of teaching that heals the terminally sick people and forgives sins and raises the dead, that stuff, we will charge them not to speak in this name anymore. So that's what they did. They commanded them. They warned them. They threatened them. They charged them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus anymore. The entire Sanhedrin at this point after hearing an invitation to come and believe on the one way to be saved, the builders, the, the, the builders that rejected the cornerstone, this was an invitation for them to repent and believe in Jesus. And instead, they say, you need to stop it or else. They should have turned to Christ. But in fear of losing their power, their temple, their entire religion, they forbid any more of this. But in verses 19 and 20, Peter and John answer with the same holy boldness here. They say, well, let me ask you guys, what, what do you think we should do? Y'all are the judges, right? Should we listen to what God says or what you say? 
because it ain't the same story. You're the judges. I'd love to hear your judgment, right? You, you can see the, the, the little bit of the uh, irony and the sarcasm. He pokes it back at them. You guys are the judges. Tell us who to listen to, to God or to you. Are you going to tell us to listen to you over Yahweh? Because this is what he's done. We can't help but speak of what we've seen and heard. We're going to talk about him. We, we have to. We will not corroborate. We will not say what you want us to say. And this wasn't a matter of this is what we should do for the apostles. This was a must. There are no other options. There are no other possibilities in their brains. All they can do is be witnesses to the testimony of Jesus Christ. We have decided to follow Jesus, sirs. There is no turning back. No turning back. They openly refuse the Sanhedrin. But notice something. Peter did not cut off anybody's ears. Right? Pre-resurrection, Jesus ready th- or Peter was ready to throw hands. Post-resurrection, he realized that God is a lot better at taking care of that stuff. You know, like when he raised Jesus from the dead. Their role was to humbly testify to Christ, no matter the cost. Which I think maybe means that when we are called to disobey the governing authorities... It does not mean beating up people in Jesus' name, storming Capitol buildings in Jesus' name, causing riots in Jesus' name, causing chaos in Jesus' name. It's called to humbly testify to the gospel and the one way by which men can be saved. Be humble, preach Jesus no matter what. So in verses 21 and 22, the Sanhedrin tries to threaten them a little more. But ultimately, they just let him go. They say, we, we've got no real way of punishing these dudes. This thing was way too public. They were outnumbered by the people who believed. All of Jerusalem was praising God for what had happened. The man who was healed was more than 40 years old. He'd never walked a day in his life. They all knew him, right? And now the 40-year-old crippled man is now walking. It's ironic because Peter and John were being threatened by the Sanhedrin, but it was the Sanhedrin that felt threatened by the power of the gospel, right? The miracle, the resurrected Christ and the lame man was uncontested. A punishment would only make them look worse. So for now, Peter and John are free to go. Beloved, are you willing to listen and obey God's call on your life, no matter the cost? I think oftentimes we, we, we want to say yes when there's other Christians in the room, but what happens when it gets hard? Or what happens when our audience changes? Do we feel that we must testify no matter what? Or do we hide our devotion to Christ around a certain set of people? Sometimes Christians can be very bipolar. We behave this way with such worship in front of you know, all the Christian people, and then over here, people would have no idea we were Christians. And it's maybe it's not that even people are trying to persecute you, your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, people in your circle, whatever, that you're just not acting the same around. It's not persecution. Perhaps it's just a fear of man that hinders your testimony before them. This text urges us to be the same Christians we are on Sundays in front of every other person every other day of the week. We must testify to Christ. No matter who's in front of us, the very president, bosses, rulers, whoever, we're to be followers, disciples of Jesus. Our life is buried with Christ. Our life is hidden with Christ. Our life is raised with Christ. He is our identity at all times, even when we don't want him to be. Even when we stumble and fall and we sin and we mess up. Don't be ashamed of the gospel, no matter who is in the room. Own it with boldness, with certainty. Christ is alive. And you are his witness. And how do you know if you're being the same Christian before all men? Well, I think their observation is good. Have you been with Jesus? 
they recognized through their boldness that these were the men who had been with Jesus. People will tell, will be able to tell if you've been with Jesus. Now, obviously, we were not there for his earthly ministry. We weren't there for the cross or the resurrection or the ascension. But who are we baptized into? The strong name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We are his disciples. No one else's, right? So do people see that we belong to Christ? We follow him. He's the cornerstone. He's the builder. He's the head of the church. No other name. Which means we were not baptized into the name of John Calvin. We were not baptized in the name of Billy Graham. We were not baptized in the name of conservative Christianity. We were not baptized in the name of liberal Christianity. We were not baptized in the name of any of those dudes on YouTube that you listen to. We were baptized into the one name, the strong name, the name above all names, Jesus Christ the Lord. He is our master. No one else. Do people see through your talk, your behavior, your speech, that you are aspiring after Christ or after your favorite theologian or after me? But I hope it's not me. Y'all, come on. That's, you're in a bad way if it's me, right? People see that Christ is the standard. His word, his teaching. No other name, as helpful as other names may be, there is only salvation in one. And people see that in us when we have been with Christ. Beloved, you may one day be in a situation in which you are silenced for your faith in Jesus Christ. Your confidence to refuse the bullies will not come from any man. Even if we listen to the stories of the martyrs and how they were persecuted even unto death, they give us hope, they give us confidence. But our ultimate assurance, our ultimate hope, our ultimate strength and refuge is in the strong name of Jesus who became sin for us and died the death we deserved and rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. He will raise us too from the dead. So we do not fear those who kill the body, but we fear those, the one name, who can kill both body and soul in hell. That, friends, is the strong name of Jesus, who saved even you. He's our confidence. He's our peace. He's our motivation. He's why we do outrageous things in front of people who would rather have us silenced and killed. He's why we do it. We will not corroborate. We will proclaim Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, there is but one name that saves, and it is Jesus, and it's that one name that now empowers us to be your witnesses even when difficulty comes. Oh, I pray that you would give this church such a consistency that when people see us, they see the wonderful name of Jesus lived out. They see that we are followers of him. Uh, Father, we thank you, Father, for, for the, the privilege to get to be disciples of Jesus. Help us to be bold, to be certain, to be sure, to be confident, to testify when the time comes. And thank you for the testimony of your church who did this decades and decades ago and is still doing it today until every name hears. Help us to finish the task, <clears throat> no matter how bad it gets. In Jesus' name, amen.